Can I turn it back off now? Let me see. Yeah. Okay. There you go. I want to laugh. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm not going to laugh. Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see everyone here as we have gathered for our November West Louisville Forum. We have uh, had a great year resurging with our West Louisville Forum, coming back in person, but we're still live streaming, so we want to welcome those of you who are watching via live stream as well. Uh, we have a very provocative subject today that we'll get into shortly, but on behalf of Simmons College of Kentucky and our president, Dr. Kevin Cosby, 
we indeed welcome you. We want to make sure everyone knows we have begun pre-registration for our spring semester. We already have upwards of 60 new students planning to come in in the spring, and we are excited about that. We're also launching in the spring uh, new athletic programs, cross country and track and field, as well as women's volleyball. And so we're going to have a very exciting spring. So I want to get the word out, want to make sure that we seize the time now to help anyone that wants to enroll in Simmons. They can get in touch with our admissions department and start the process immediately. Uh, also in this coming uh, spring, we'll be launching our Second Chance Pell initiative where Simmons will begin academic involvement for those who are incarcerated. And we are excited about the growth of what that program will be and what it will mean for those lives who can receive education and with Simmons, walking with them, help them uh, to reduce their sentences to uh, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky that has this opportunity. So we're excited. Let's give Simmons a hand on that. We just come out of the very exciting homecoming. I would encourage you to visit our Instagram page as well as our Facebook page and look back to what happened last week. We had a wonderful time. So many from over this community who came and many of you participated. We want to say thank you. Let's continue to support the basketball teams of Simmons. Uh, keep track of our women's team. Guess what? They played, was it Fisk? On the, they play Fisk on the 25th. Who did they play last night? Indiana University Southeast. Guess what? We beat IU. We beat IU. <laughs> and we're glad. We're glad. So let's support our men's and our women's team. Um, home games are played right here at the Family Life Center. And uh, let's keep track of both our men's and women's teams and support them. Uh, at this time, I would like to bring up uh, Mr. Kevin Scruggs, who is the Sovereign Grand Inspector General of Kentucky for the Scottish Rite Masonry, and there is a special presentation that they would like to make to our president. Would you welcome him? Sovereign Grand Commander Dr. Corey D. Hawkins to Esquire, the United Supreme Council, and the Chair of the Foundation. We'd like to present Simmons, you and Simmons College uh, this charity for donation. Thank you so much. Wow. All right. Thank you so much, Say again. Can I announce? Yes, sir. $3,750.31. Thank you. Thank you so very Appreciate much you. on behalf of Simmons Nation. Thank you. Wow. It's always good to start with some money, you know. Here you go, Dr. Smith. Welcome to uh, our Westwood Forum. And those of you who are watching online, welcome. We're excited about our special guests. Um, they are really uh, honorary Louisvillians. They've been here so many times, and they have had such a profound impact on our city and on this president. And um, they have cast a shadow across this nation that is transforming our country. Uh, Yvette Carnell, Antonio Moore, goodness and mercy, that's who they are, have returned back to our city to give us an update and a, an assessment of what's going on with this vital movement that they gave birth to by the grace of God, and that's the Adolf's movement. We're honored to have them, and today we're just going to turn it over to them just to engage themselves in dialogue, and then I will come back and um, we will open the floor for questions so that we can dialogue with them. But I don't want to delay them anymore. Won't you welcome my brother and my sister, uh, Esquire? Uh, Antonio Moore and the brilliant Yvette Carnell.
How's everybody doing today? All right, so we got a bit of a presentation for you that we prepared. Um, I guess uh, we'll start with the uh, first image here. Um, so essentially, we started the ADOS Foundation. Uh, and, well, let me say the ADOS concept because uh, because in so many ways, people were asking for a solution from both of us for a problem that race presented. But what we realized is that if you don't anchor identity, you can't really get to that solution. So back in 2017, Black America show what we're talking about, the show titled Barack Obama, Kamala Harris, and Affirmative Actions Diversity Problem. We're talking about what the United States Supreme Court just recently started talking about that last week in regard to affirmative action. We all know that there's a 6-3 split in the court. But the court is now hassling, tussling with the idea what happens after diversity. Well, we told the court what would happen five years ago. Um, essentially, we can go to the next image. And on this image, what essentially we were showing is, and this is from a book club, and I'll let Yvette just chime in and explain this, this, this image in this uh, book, because she uh, covered it in her book club that she used to do for Breaking Brown. And it sets the framework for why ADOS is so important. Well, one of the things that we talked about, and, and those of you all who have been around remember, is that there is no flat blackness. You have to be anchored in lineage. That's the foundation of what we talked about. It doesn't mean that that in any way oppresses anybody or you don't have to be xenophobic, but you have to be anchored in your story, in your American story, in our American story, which starts at slavery, goes through Reconstruction, Jim Crow. Now we hear mass incarceration. So what this chart shows you, when you look at that black line too of all immigrants, and it goes all the way to the top and it's skyrocketing, it tells you, what it's telling you is that one, there are groups here that kind of can mask our failure, who necessarily look like us but don't have that very same experience, and that number's going up. So if you don't anchor yourself in who you are and what we come from in terms of disinheritance of wealth, in terms of the wealth that has been stolen, has been robbed from us, what you'll have is a lot of confusion. And we're living in that moment of confusion right now where we don't understand ourselves and we see ourselves, see ourselves in terms of blackness as opposed to being American descendants of slavery. Now, I also want you to pay attention to a specific reality of the dates. There is a narrative in most people's heads that we were all here together during Jim Crow. It's not true. This book, um, Immigration and Remaking of Black America, takes the census data and shows that the bulk of black immigration happened 10 and 20 years after Jim Crow ended. That's important for us to get to as we go through the rest of the discussion. So I just wanted to anchor that part. But now going to the next image is the consequence of not talking about that. So this chart on the bottom is a timeline that I had made that breaks America down into like quadrants so you can kind of understand. Slavery, the existence of it, is three of those boxes. Jim Crow is another quarter or half of another box. We've only been free so long, and it is during that free period that we saw the rise in black immigration. Now, the reason that's important is because of the text I put in this tweet. America has failed the Ados Negro. My mother and father suffered that lineal cost. Now the first black president was not Ados. The first black VP was not Ados. The first black attorney general, Eric Holder, was not Ados. And the first black press secretary is not an American descendant of slavery. I went to UCLA, I went to Loyola Law School. Where is my opportunity? I want to play a short clip. I know you have us up here to get you, have you understand where we were at five years ago. It'll be about two and a half minutes.
if he, if he can't get it, we can move on. That's all, okay. Immigrants from around the world, and I'm going to pull this article up for you so you can follow a little bit, are increasingly coming to America. Those pat- patterns have made that perennially un- unpopular topic, diversity initiatives in higher education, harder to promote at a time when support is flagging. The education ga- gap between blacks and the broader society has narrowed appreciably, yet still lags at a time when data suggests overall U.S. middle class achievement and the middle class Black, black middle class in a particular has been stymied by the Great Recession. However, at least one academic argues that changing demographics make a case for more affirmative action. When affirmative action started, this is a quote from a, a professor, Kevin Brown, law professor at the Indiana University's Morris School. Um, when affirmative action started, 99% of the blacks in the country were native born. The assumption was that you'd be helping black descendants of slavery and segregation through the program. Brown says the influx of non-whites from places such as the Caribbean, Africa, and Latin America has complicated the use of preferences in higher education. So I wanted you to chime in on on that point that he's making. Well, here's the thing. As it's currently written, affirmative action is unsustainable. And if I was a white man, I would be upset too. Because the thing is, it has it to where if you're a white woman, if you if you're anything but a white man, you have access to something that he doesn't have access to. And really, it should be designated for people who have a specific claim. Because if you have it just for African Americans who are descendants of slaves, if it goes to the Supreme Court or wherever, you're not just making the argument that they're making now. The argument that they're making now is well, affirmative action is good because we need diversity on campus. That's bull. It's not intended for that. It's intended to make up and correct. For, 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 for a justice claim, for us not getting, for us being enslaved and then Jim Crow and then Reconstruction and white people destroy white mobs and the KKK, it's intended for that. It's intended to give us back some of, to give us a doorway into corporate America, education, all that. It's, it was never intended to just have diversity on campus. So it is doomed to fail unless it is it's reverted back to just African Americans. So, and, and, I, and it was, what's the trip is, that's the intention, right? But what yeah. it's actually resulted in is that it's jet fueled the potential of these new immigrants in a highly competitive America. So I always hear from new immigrants that, you know, whether it be new immigrants from Asia, such as Koreans, Japanese, whether it be uh, immigrants from Africa, from Nigeria and and the like, that we're just better at school. Well, it's not just a matter of being better at school, it's being better at school and then, and then being able to compete against a group that was not allowed to go to school. Until mm-hmm. until yep. relatively recent has recently historically, I don't think that Black America understands what other groups were benefiting from while your family was enslaved. I don't think Black America understands what other groups were not cut out of while your family was culturally like castrated. Even when you look at the the type of of slavery that was enacted in Haiti and Jamaica, it wasn't the cultural castration that you saw here in America. So you were able to ground yourself with language still with community. It wasn't the purposeful devastation of family in the same way. And I think that for for, for all of this, there's just not been enough discussion. And and the, the the major like people that have carried that burden are descendants of American African American slavery, the descendants of American slavery, because what, what has ended up happening is that we get all the cost of America's losses and then other groups get all the gains. You look at the new that So if you can pull up the uh recent statements by I think we have to deal with that but by the Supreme Court um just last week so five years ago we're saying that in response the amount of vitriol and attack we received was traumatic we were told that we were divisive for only doing what people do in any country in the world which is anchor their lineage but what people were actually saying is that they were against reparations, just reversing into it. Um, so essentially, hold on one second. It's okay. Um, so essentially now I, I wanna, before I get to the Supreme Court statements and you can start reading it now so you can, so when I get to it, you can, I'll let Yvette chime in because again, that's five years ago that we're saying that. Well, and I, I I don't think one of the things that happens, though, is that you have to get credit for being right. 
right? And so, you know, that's kind of how we define people. And that's kind of how we define missions. That's how we define movements. And one of the things that's happened in terms of in terms of why we said that though, it wasn't to like Antonio says, we always get accused of being divisive. Nobody ever says, oh my gosh, they were right. And nobody ever says, okay, what is the consequence of that misunderstanding? You have to understand what has been done wrong and what has been done right. And you have to understand what it means to be right that long ago, right? That's five years ago. That's five years ago of us saying like this, this was backy was wrongly decided, right? That's, that's, and I heard somebody else tell me, well, wasn't Thurgood there and Thurgood, read Thurgood's, if you get a chance, read Thurgood's uh, dissent, read what he wrote in that case, because there were like six different opinions, right, in terms of that. Read what he said about race and affirmative action and how it should be used and what should happen, because it wasn't what we see. And he said, he said the same thing we're saying now. He said, yeah, okay, I get it, but that's not the intention here. And you can't tell me, and this is Thurgood, that we can't use the law to make up for something that that law did. You can't tell me that. And so that's the framework from which you are supposed to understand that, not just going along to get along and saying, well, we got to go with diversity because I'd rather not have diversity. I rather, If you're going to kill affirmative action, get rid of it and let us rebuild it. The same way they say they're going to codify Roe v. Wade because they didn't like the people who didn't like that decision. You have to say, OK, we have to we have to codify affirmative action. But for the people it was intended to, it's not going to be a catch all. So essentially now. That we have both the framework of the timeline and, I, and I'll add in, remember the remaking of, of Black America chart, because Thurgood is talking about talking from a context at the beginning of that chart where there aren't many black immigrants in America. So of course, when he says black, he means ADOS. Yeah. Well, we, we, we have three cases when we look at affirmative action. And, and this wasn't the initial presentation I planned on doing, but the Supreme Court gave us a great way to see this in terms of action. Because everyone asks, what next? Well, the next is the Supreme Court actually arguing exactly what Yvette Carnell just said. They were saying, and we'll go through it in a second, what Yvette said. There's three major affirmative action cases. There's the Baki case with the UC Regents, shout out to UCLA, back in 78, 79. There's the uh, next case, which came out, which is the Grutter case. And we're going to go through some of the language of this. This is the building. It isn't just about hollering the word reparations. It is about building towards understanding reparations. So we're going to go through the Grutter case in part. Then we're going to come forward to also looking at the current case, which was just last week. It's North Carolina, Harvard, dealing with diversity. And what's interesting about this is you have two sides. And now it isn't just white America attacking affirmative action. It's, it's, it's as I understand it, a bulk of different groups attacking affirmative action as being unfair because it's not set up right. So essentially, let's start here. We're gonna play her words about a, a example she gives in a second, because I want you guys to hear her eloquent words on, on, on affirmative action. I believe this is one of her first cases, and she did a great job. This new justice, Katanji Brown Jackson. As I understand your no race conscious admission rule, a white legacy applicant and a black applicant, those ancestors were enslaved would have a dramatically different opportunity to tell their family and to have them count. I want you to understand these two attorneys on both sides are not here to argue on slavery. They didn't know that slavery was going to be the central issue, but on the right and the left of the court, over and over again, slavery came up. We have 78, we have 03, and now we have 2022. On the, on the, so that's Katanji Brown Jackson. Then you have Justice Kavanaugh. You, you said, actually, I'll let you read that part. Oh, I can't see. Oh, you can't see that. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm glad you, <laughs> you, you said, I think to Justice Gorsuch, and I'm sorry to interrupt. This is the words of Justice Kavanaugh last week. His question, but you said to Justice Gorsuch, I, I think that the benefit for former slaves was not race-based. If that's correct, then the benefit for descendants of former slaves is also not race-based. 
I want you to see you have the right and the left of the court telling these, these attorneys, we're going to make a new argument over what affirmative action should have been about. Triggered by this room. We had a conference here. At that conference, the New York Times flew somebody down here for eight hours. They printed about that conference in their paper. We're going to show you later on. It takes the argument that me and Yvette were just having and puts it into the New York Times. How do we know that one or if not both of these Supreme Court justices did not read about what happened here on, in 2019? I believe they did, if I had to call it. If you can go to the next image. And let me say one thing really, really quick too. What they're saying is, is what, it's, it's, it's an understatement to say it's what makes sense. What we have always been trying to, and what they're planting the seeds of, and the door that they're kind of leaving open, is saying that lineage is non-racial. It only is racial to the extent that America decided to create race. But even then, it's non-racial. If, if you create flat blackness, and you have a bunch of different people from a bunch of different places that qualify as black, you then can't say American descendants of slavery is race because you, you've created a flat blackness. That is lineage now, and that's what they're saying. What they're saying is that we see, a, we see a world where we can talk about redress for a specific group of people, but it's not a racial door that a lot of people who have not been aggrieved can come through, right? It's saying that, and even when you go further, there are several points here, and Antonio is going to get to some of them, what they're talking about is this door is for redress. This door is for repair. This door is not just for a general opportunity because that doesn't sunset. And they're saying that we need this to sunset at some point. And it can't end if the job is to maintain it. If the job is to maintain diversity, there's no end. But if the job is to repair, we can create certain metrics where we can say, okay, we're here. we have repaired this group or we're close to repairing this group. Whether you talk about getting close to closing the lineage wealth gap or I wouldn't even close it then. I wouldn't even stop there. But I think that's the time once you've closed the lineage wealth gap, you can start having the discussion on when we sunset. If you're maintaining diversity, then it goes on forever. And it just doesn't make sense. It's never made sense. So, so let's set the framework again. We have the West Louisville Forum. We have the Angela Project. We have the ADOS Conference. And now we have the Supreme Court. So when you sit here, it looks like so many people are here. But the reverberative like, momentum of this room has been felt all the way at the top of this nation. No one was talking about lineage. No one was talking about ADOS. No one was talking about you. That is why the president, the VP, the first attorney general did not come from your family. And so I say this to say the reason I know they weren't talking about you is to look at Grutter. So Grutter versus Bollinger is the 03 case. So I said, let me go back and get the 03 case, Yvette. Let's see if they was what they were saying in the words of the 03 case. Grutter versus Bollinger. So you search for the word slavery in the whole document. This is the oral arguments. Zero. Because they were not talking about lineage in 03. The world of diversity was birthed out of Grutter. And in that world, just being flat black was the same as having a descendant of slavery in your family that toiled the soil, that built the country, that, that had their family stolen from them, and it erased you. It elevated someone else and it erased you. Let's look at some of the words in Grutter. Students, particularly from the black and Hispanic. Does that sound like the same case? Minority, really 75% of black students below the college level are at schools that are more than 50% minority. They weren't talking about minority. They were saying diversity most likely will be struck down. And they are signaling, regardless of what the attorneys are saying, I want everybody to understand the, uh, the degree to which you have the justices sitting there. They're arguing from the bench without the attorneys even understanding what's going on, that this always should have been ADOS. You want to join in? 
No, they're signaling. And I think what they are doing is opening in a door for the attorneys to have a specific argument. And they weren't opening the door really for them to have a specific argument about diversity. At a certain point, you really kind of feel that diversity dying um, in terms of affirmative action is a foregone conclusion. You know, when, when Clarence Thomas says, I don't understand diversity, diversity looks to me just like everything for everybody. The attorney couldn't argue against it. Now, you don't have to be a fan of Clarence Thomas to understand he has a point. And that is falling. But they say, listen, we're leaving you a window. We're signaling that this is the position. This is the only non-racial position that you can argue from. It's the only way that this makes sense is redress. It's the only way you have an end date. Do you want to argue about this? And the attorneys, if you listen to the oral argument, they get confused. So they, so they have been anchoring you in a race when the value is in your lineage. Um, I want everyone to remember 2015, 2017 Yvette. The Yvette clip that we said where she said basically what Katanji, what, what uh, uh, Kavanaugh said, that this can't survive unless it is ADOS oriented. I want to play a clip for you. It's a short clip because you have to hear the eloquence with which Katanji Brown uh, makes this great case around affirmative action. This is last Monday, UNC uh, Harvard case, oral arguments. UNC is doing the kind of micromanaging you're talking about with respect to racial classifications. I, I didn't see that they were shooting for a particular target or that there was a goal or that I, I thought, in fact, that as the reviewers went through the process, they didn't even know how many other students of color had been admitted. And if they did know, they had to be recused. So they're not operating the system, I thought, that was to reach toward some sort of racial goal. Am I wrong about that? Well, that policy was instituted after our lawsuit was filed, before our lawsuit was filed, at least senior admissions officers who were reading files were allowed to see those. So the policy is that they're not reaching towards some sort of goal. As a post-litigation, no, I, I would not go, go so far as to say that. And in particular, I would I would look at the, the race control alternatives analysis that UNC's own expert proffered, uh, and, and this is actually throughout the record, even in the admission. All right, process. I have little time. I'm sorry. No, so, I'm sorry. I don't. I, yeah, do you, so, but you say they've changed the process, but now at least they're not looking toward a goal of, they're not race balancing in that same sense. No, I think they measured their standard as to what they could achieve by race neutral alternatives, by whether they can replicate the precise level of diversity to today. So I think that is a form of. All right, so let me ask you another question, because I take it that your position is that UNC is allowed to consider other non-race-based personal characteristics of individual applicants, like someone's status as a parent or a military veteran or a disabled person, and give pluses in the current holistic environment for those characteristics without running afoul of the 14th Amendment. Is that right? I, I, th I think that is generally correct, as long as it's a criteria that is not uh, walled off by the 14th Amendment. It's they, can, they, can get, they can give pluses. And so what I'm worried about is that the rule that you're advocating, um, that in the context of a holistic review process, the university can take into account and value all of the other background and personal characteristics of other applicants, but they can't value race. What I'm worried about is that that seems to me to have the potential of causing more of an equal protection problem than it's actually solving. And the reason why I get to that possible conclusion is thinking about two applicants who would like to have their family backgrounds credited in this applications process. And I'm hoping to get your reaction to this hypothetical. The first applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family has been in this area for generations since before the Civil War. And I would like uh, you to know that I will be the fifth generation to graduate from the University of North Carolina. I now have that opportunity to, to do that. And given my family background, it's important to me that I get to attend this university. I want to honor my family's legacy by going to this school. The second applicant says, I'm from North Carolina. My family's been in this area for generations since before the Civil War, but they were slaves and never had a chance to attend this venerable institution. 
as an African American, I now have that opportunity and given my family, family background, it's important to me. I honor my family legacy by going to this school. Now, as I understand your no, two applicants would have a dramatically different opportunity to tell their family stories and to have them count. The first applicant would be able to have his family background considered and valued by the institution as part of its consideration of whether or not to admit him, while the second one wouldn't be able to because his story is in many ways bound up with his race and with the race of his ancestors. So I want to know, based on how your rule would likely play out in scenarios like that, why exclude? So um, I, I'm going to let Yvette speak, but we come back to us talking in 2017 and signaling an event and me having a discussion and saying diversity can't survive. And the consequence that we got back from the major legacy orgs, the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, media. Can we go back to that image? Uh, the, one that, the one that you had up before that, uh, right there. We'll get to this. Um, they call it controversial for saying the same things now five years later. Controversial group. When you have someone cover you that way, it becomes hard to grow. Because they're casting you as though you're divisive when in actuality you're just anchoring the truth. Controversial group ADOS divides black Americans. Isn't that what the Supreme Court just did on Monday of last week in the fight for economic equality? American descendants of slavery advocates are stirring debate. So the debate was stirred here, right here in this church. Dr. Cosby, Yvette, myself. And then now everybody wants to act like they don't remember where it was stirred. You had The Intercept talking about Joy Reid and Angela Rye calling us Russian bots. You can get investigated behind being called Russian bots. You have Harvard doing a diversity case right now, and myself and Yvette are involved in litigation because they de defamed us and then retracted the defamation. You have the truth of the inability to do politics, because when you do real politics, you get your feet cut out from under you. You want to join in? Well, I want to, I want to go back to the Supreme Court for just one moment and kind of explain um, what, what Ketanji was saying. She was saying these people have a lineage that they want honored, respected, and really it deserves a redress. But at the minimum, they have a lineage Whereas this other person whose family went here has a legacy. What she's telling you is that lineage is legacy. Lineage and legacy are the same thing. And you can't erase one person's legacy and honor the other person. And one of the problems that we have had, not just in terms of what Antonio is pointing to here, there are a lot of people who don't want to be invested in their own lineage and don't understand that your lineage is your legacy, and you can run away from it all day. It's just like running away from your own shadow. You ain't gonna ever get away from it. And that's what she was saying. You can't honor legacy of this person because his father went here, because this person built a museum, or because this person did X, Y, and Z, and you're not honoring the lineage, which is the legacy of an ADOS person. That is erasure. So when we, when we do these, these, these speaking events, the purpose is hopefully to lead to the Supreme Court changing laws. We're at that point now. You have, uh, if you could pull up the last image you pulled up with the light blue. You have Yvette, and I wanted to speak to this, meeting with the OMB. How many people are familiar with the OMB here? 
the O and B decides the 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 black, Hispanic, white on the on the, everything that you apply. Trying to get ADOS as one of the categories. Can you talk about that? Well, and shout out to the people inside the org who have all very very hard with 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 no money, like nobody's getting paid. Um, and we did a presentation um, to the office of White House Office of Management and Budget, saying that the, there should be a new designation, um, and that designation should be for ADOS, who are American descendants of slavery. Um, and you know, <laughs> so so you know, shout out to everyone um, who was involved with doing that. But it goes back, even that goes back in terms of it, it goes back to what Antonio and I have been talking about. But it also goes to the question becomes as we how many people are going to support, you know, I can I can be president of the ADOS Advocacy Foundation all day, but how many people are going to support that work? Because one of the things that has always happened is there's been a loud group of a few people who do really support and who show up. But there are a lot of people who need that inheritance and need the reparations that need our black agenda who aren't showing up. You have to show up for this work, and that's what we're doing because it always was supposed to lead. That's the reason we're at the OMB. It's supposed to lead to policy. It's supposed to lead to changes. We always talked about how flat blackness masks our failure. So you can't really see how wealthless we are. You can't really see what we don't have. Okay, now is the moment to do it. Now is the moment to show up and actually make that case for why that matters. Now is the moment to say, you say, well, what do we do? This whole thing came out of what do we do? Reparations came out of what do we do? The org also comes out of what do we do? Where do we show up? How do we show up? And the answer is just right in front of you. So when we look at disaggregation, again, uh, it's ironic, and I think, I think it's ordained, would you call it that? Ordained that the Supreme Court decided, or not decided, or argued, less than a week ago on this very topic, saying that we're not going to listen to y'all lawyers. We're going to listen to ADOS. We're going to have our own case. Because you got one side arguing for diversity. We don't need that. And you got another side arguing against diversity. We don't need that. We, the Supreme Court, right and left, agreed on something. And that was that ADOS is a central part, the central part of affirmative action. Without that, it don't make any sense. So I also want people to understand the disaggregation, the categorical importance of disaggregation, because Yvette spoke to it. But that's why I built the discussion, because there's certain things you got to build into the understanding. This isn't just about receiving. This is about knowing. Right now, black folks are largely erased. What do I mean? When you look at the Hispanic vote, they can get granular data on the on the Cubans in Florida. They can get granular data on the on the Mexicans in California. No one is keeping data on Haitians, on Jamaicans, on ADOS. We just black. You can micro target as a result. And also, we don't see the difference in our voting patterns. Maybe some groups are highly conservative amongst the black population. And so I think that that- And, and hold on, Tom, who carries the weight of that when they're conservative? So if it's all just black, black, right? We, we carry the weight. We do. And, and in addition, that doesn't stop at the voting. It goes to the prisons. More black men incarcerated than almost any place in the history of the world by rape. Never seen anything like it. But we don't know if those are all ADOS people because we haven't been talking about it. We haven't been collecting the data. So when you get the category, then you get the information. I want people to understand that before the 90s, they didn't give us wealth data. They just gave us income. So it looked like blacks and whites had similar amounts of, of, of wealth. After the 90s, and I found this out from Thomas Shapiro, who wrote the work, work, book Black Wealth, White Wealth. You can watch his interview with me on my channel. And he came up with the term racial wealth gap. So the image of the Cosby Show and the image of the Fresh Prince of Bel Air is built out of not understanding the wealth that wealth gaps that we know now. Well, the same thing goes for disaggregation. You are voting 
you are allowing to be nominated people that might not represent the interests of the ADOS population because we all look the same. How many people have complained about Barack Obama and what we got out of him as the black population? How many people anchored it to, to lineage? Yvette wrote a piece, hold on, 11 years ago that said uh, Barack Obama is not African American. He's a killer. 11 years ago, I voted down ballot Democrat 08 and 12. I'm not right wing. But I saw where that was going. Now it's time to galvanize the population. The consequence, though, can't be borne by us. Like in terms of personal reputation, inability to even create a foundation because we get suppressed and we get attacked by the top of America. Let me give you an example. I'm sitting around and a, and a, and a good friend tells me, you know that um, Jack follows you. I said, who's Jack? Anybody know who Jack is on Twitter? Jack created Twitter. He has four, he follows 4,000 people and, and uh, he has 6 million followers. He's a multi-billionaire. He's following both of us. This reached to the, even in terms of media, media doesn't send people out anymore. They sent somebody on a plane, actually two people, a photographer, for eight hours for our conference. Can we go to the next? that she brought up reparations in a way it had never been on the presidential stage. She got it from, in part, my show. She came on my show, and she also came to the conference. And I informed her on what to say when she went on the presidential stage. So now we have the ADOS message with little to no donations other than fives and tens from our shows, and this man here with his black church and his HBCU, leading to reparations being on the presidential stage, lineage being in the, the lexicon of the Supreme Court, the OMB meeting happening where we're talking about categories, and we still get people walking up to us asking us, what's the solution? Somebody asked me the other day, I said, what's the solution? We'll find out in the spring when they knock down this diversity. I think that... Uh, I want to read a little bit of this. How did Marianne Williamson get woke on reparations? Williamson has been talking about reparations in 97 and recently began discussions with American descendants of slavery. This is the Philadelphia Inquirer. For the last two years, a fairly new organization called American Descendants of Slavery has argued that black Americans whose ancestors were enslaved are in dire financial situations because of the racial wealth gap and that reparations is, is one way to address the injustice. Um, because the because Williamson wrote a 97 book, Healing the Soul of America, Reclaiming Our Voices as Spiritual Citizens, which discusses reparations as a way to heal racism, a national character defect, the group reached out to Williamson in February to talk on co-founder Tony O'Moore's Tone Talk show on Dash Radio on YouTube. I brought Yvette on it. Discussion, and that's all donation for me and Yvette, that lead to, led to the Supreme Court finally being given a pathway, because the court is only going to follow what the people ask them to follow, to move this from diversity to lineage to begin to see us and see many of your children and your children's children that don't have opportunity right now, and it's not altogether clear for you, but I will tell you as a black male that went to UCLA, that went to Loyola Law, there's not a lot of opportunity for this out here because we made it about diversity. This is the next image. I'm almost this is the ADOS conference. We have Cornell West. We have Marianne Williamson, Dr. Cosby with Marianne. We have not been able to have these kind of discussions because we've been tiptoeing around these kind of discussions. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Well, I, 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 don't, I don't think, um, and, I, and I've talked to Dr. Cosby about this. I, it's how the, it's not, it's the discussion, people don't understand that this discussion centers you. Lineage centers you, your life, your needs, uh, the thing that will make you American, your need for wealth, right? What you're owed. If you can't galvanize around yourself, if we can't galvanize around ourselves, 
there's something else that we need to assess because there's something else going on if you can't prioritize you. Come on. And I think we have to get to the heart of that because everybody else is more than happy to prioritize themselves and say, this is what we're owed and this is what we need to do and, 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 and support anybody who prioritizes them, especially when it's a need. Like we have people that prioritize themselves and there is no, there is no redress need, right? There was no slavery. There was no Jim Crow for them. There was no reconstruction for them, but they'll still prioritize their needs and say, this is what we need in our community. And we're going to end out with something that show that. Yeah, and we're going we, we gonna to get what we're going to get. And it, we'll say it all the time. Politics is a competition. Anybody who tells you otherwise is just telling you a lie. They're competing for that money. Yeah, and, and when, we, when we, the last image, we only have two left, uh, is going to actually give context to what she says. Can you bring this ADOS image? This is, the, this is the New York Times. This was in print on the New York Times and on, on, online. But the, the, the writer told us that, the, that, that more editors reviewed this than any story about Palestine. When you read it, it's kind of, it's a quirky story. But what matters is this line in the, almost the third paragraph. And they argue that affirmative action policies originally designed to help the descendants of slavery in America have largely been used to benefit other groups, including immigrants from Africa and the Caribbean. Yeah. Nobody was saying this, though, when this is written. So this is actually... Not even the Supreme Court? Not even the <laughs> Supreme Court. So this is the doorway, because this is the biggest paper in print to have the discussion that is now being had at the court that leads to the opportunity for your child that you might not see today. I'm going to end on one last image to give context to what Yvette said. There's three images here. This one in the middle is mine. The reason it's mine is because this is my lineage. It says Aaron Moore up there. This is his refusal to be part of the Mississippi Choctaw. They refused him. 1905, 1903, you go all the way back. Why did you bring that up? Because Yvette just said people are arguing for specifics. Well, UCLA, Michigan, it's free to go there now for Native Americans. UC tuition will be free for California native students in the fall. I'm not native. So they made Native American about being native by blood, but Native Americans held slaves too. I want to read to you, because a lot of people don't know, the context of what I'm saying. So why is your... In 1860, about, 18, about 30 years after their removal to Indian territory from their respective homes in Southeast, Cherokee Nation citizens owned 2,500 slaves, 15% of their population. Choctaw, hold on, Choctaw, same thing up there, a Mississippi Choctaw. So when I do my ancestry, I don't have any percentage Native American. That means he was a slave to these people. Choctaw citizens owned 2,349 slaves, 14% of their total population, and Creek citizens owned 1,500 slaves. Chickasaw citizens owned 1,000 slaves, just about 975, which amounted to 18%. We're talking about huge percentages of their population, and nobody knows. They could created a whole term to combat ADOS, what they call it, Yvette, BIPOC. <laughs> the lady get on the phone with us from the Reuters, she say, what do you think about BIPOC? Because we said the Indians own slaves. She didn't write that story. 18% um, of their total population, a proportion equivalent to that of white slave owners in Tennessee. So if they have percentages of slaves equivalent to white folks, why don't they get seen like white folks? Because we don't even know they own slaves. And I'm bringing that up for context because if we don't know, he gets refused. They get free tuition, proving Yvette's point, and we don't even understand. We just hear Yvette's point in the abstract. They are getting free tuition today, and nobody's calling them divisive. Because lineage matters. And lineage is you getting cut off from your lineage. Lineage is you being erased from your lineage. 
lineage is not understanding ADOS. Let me say, um, when you ask people sometimes, when you talk to people and you say why, and because it's just it's not just two schools. There are all sorts of all across America. There are tuition waivers for Native Americans, and people will say, "Well, do you know what happened to the Native Americans on the Trail of Tears?" Right? That's that's why. And I'll say, "Well, some of them took their slaves on the Trail of Tears, so so they get." They get something because of what happened to them. But the slave doesn't get anything. Come on. There is no tuition waiver for an American descendant of slavery, the people who built this country. So what does it do to lineage? It makes lineage have no, no value for Negative us. value. I would say it has negative value. It has no value. So there's no reason to know him, to uplift him, to give me purpose. So when we look out in the streets of Louisville and we see young men running around, it's because they don't know their Aaron Moore. They stripped around the, re the way the reason you would have to know him to know this document exists. See, when you find this document, it gives you purpose, and then you find the church, and then you're part of the church, and then you're part of the community. But if you take this away and the tuition is gone, I'm out in the streets again. Now, I just want to say one last thing. No, go ahead. What we also found is that this isn't just in the past that they were refusing them. As recently as COVID, you had black folks that are on the reservation still, that were owned, their families were definitely owned as slaves, have the ID, but it just said 0% quantum. And they were getting rejected their COVID shot. And one of them spoke here for the conference. Uh, the, the president of Freedman spoke here about, about being denied that and everything they get denied on these... Um, these, these Native American um, That's Jim lands. Crow. Yep. That's just Jim Crow. So I just wanted to have a discussion around actual contextual things that are going on rather than the abstract con conversation about disaggregation that initially was planned because it's moving now. And the question is, are you moving along with it? And let, and let, me, let me just say, before we move on to this free tuition, one of the things an albatross around the neck of Adolf. So not only do you, not only were you told to go to school, and you don't get the reward of going to school, but you gotta, you gotta keep that debt. It's a family debt, but I just want you to understand how the life, is different. If, if that says Adolf get, I want you just to imagine that for a second as we end. If that says Adolf now get free tuition, right, all around America. Thank you. What do you think, people? Martha King Jr. says somebody told a lie one day, and they are still telling a lie today. Where is, quote unquote, black leadership? Why isn't leadership moving us? in the direction that you have established. Well, I just want to point out one thing that um, when we supported um, Byron Allen in the lawsuit um, for the civil rights case, 1860, what's it, 67? 66. 66. I just want to point out that before that, the NAACP was there supporting DACA. They didn't even, the day before, they didn't even stay the next day to support a civil rights lawsuit. Um, I think that tells you that what we're dealing with um, is a country that has moved past us without fixing us, and our civil rights orgs have kept step with the country instead of keeping step with us. I believe that they've mechanized a way for you to accept a failure they created as a failure you created. So you believe that your child is wayward. But what you don't see is you didn't give him a way forward. So when I bring up that document, it gives him purpose. See, the thing that happens if you make ADOS a free tuition, there's something else that happens. People start finding out where they come from. The difference between when we find out where we come from and everyone else is it starts uprooting cities around the, around the country and, and beginning to ask questions. Why don't I own that? And so I, I just I just come back to there's been institutional mechanisms to make our orgs suppress the discussion rather than uplift it. 
don't let anyone blend you. If they blend you, they end you. You have no parallels. No one has your story. Can I give some context to that? We all look at these places like countries. They're all countries. The Caribbean it has all these different countries. Jamaica, Haiti. Not to say anything about any of those countries, but let me tell you a little something about America. Malcolm Gladwell wrote the book Outliers. In Outliers, he took the 75 richest men in the history of the world. 45 of the 75 come from America. Another four made their wealth in America. That is the wealth that came from the back of the slave, the American slave. You don't understand how wealthy your family should be because you haven't seen it before. Like our campus. Mm -hmm. Like our campus, which was the Churchill Downs plant slave plantation. Samuel Churchill. We made Churchill Downs. They would not have the wealth if it were not for us. And we, we don't know it. Questions? Let's give them a hand, y'all. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, in the back. It's real loud, please. So, so when we talk about uh, uh, ADOS, and talk about lineage, how's that defined and measured? Um, you know, there's been several criteria out there. Um, essentially, I, I prefer the double nodding in this criteria that, that I've seen before from uh, Professor Darity, but um, we've seen that before where you look at somebody and whether they've marked themselves as of a certain race for so long and then and on the other side whether they have an ancestor from slavery i also would go deeper on how many ancestors i think that uh one of the things that happens is we think this is much more difficult than it than it is because of the way that the the uh, census uh the way that the immigration patterns happen if your family was here before say 1940 you're pretty much probably an ADOS. Now, the other thing that happens is we haven't required the US government to do the work that we know they can do now technologically, to start digging in, investing billions of dollars, and to create an infrastructure to make that possible. So then we push it back to the ADOS person individually and say, I could never find that out, so why do we try? No, first make America show us that they can't figure it out, which I disagree with, and then you won't have to try. Well, and part of this, you know, part of, part of our advocacy in terms of the ADOS Advocacy Foundation is that there should be, we have a Bureau of Indian Affairs. We should have a, we should have a Bureau of ADOS Affairs. And part of, part of their job is to help us figure out where we come from. Look, there were only so many plantations. And like Antonio says, prior to a certain point, it's a given that you got to be ADOS if you were here, if you have an ancestor here during that point. I have a picture of, of, of ancestors with sharecroppers, uh, little, little denim overalls on, right? So we can do that. But just like you give help, just like they have a bureau that they can go to, just like they have, uh, the, uh, we need that. That we have never had. We built the country oppressed from slavery all the way to now, and there is no Bureau of ADOS Affairs? Do you understand what else we're seeing right now? Some people like to make the argument, you know, white people have ancestors that are black too. That's why you have the requirement to have Mark Black. But all of a sudden you create value in, value in ADOSness. What will happen is that it'll destroy race, and we'll just have lineage. Because right now the structure has been so set up around blackness having being void of value. In fact, they have the negative cause. The mechanisms to actually institute what we saw in going back to the case of 78 with Baki were never put in place, as Yvette uh, talked to me about just a few days ago. So we haven't healed. In effect, once you create value, you, you see this change where we move from blackness and whiteness to a question of what did you build here? Who are you? Who are your ancestors? 
you'd be surprised how much, and I know I've said it twice, easier it is to raise a child when that's the anchoring. And it goes from black people built America to, wait a minute, who? No, Ados built America. Come on. And it gives you, it, it instills in your child a sense of pride. Mm -hmm. You know, I always tell people all the time, there seems to be shame, but should be in the enslaver, not in the slave. Our journey is that of a hero. We're a hero journey. We're survivors. We're the people who endure to the end. And so that has to be the understanding of who we are, but you can't do that unless you disaggregate. You can't tell that story unless you disaggregate. Two more questions. Yes. Uh -huh. um, yes. Um, seeing the, the law side of it, uh, Ellis Tarver, I wanted to ask, instead of asking a government who could, who there could be implications of how they could not, we have the tools now to mark by bio biological ancestry. So why not use it from a biological argument saying if we use an ancestor, oh, I don't know if whatever DNA tracing we can do. And if we can trace it back and look at other things such as the, um, Amer uh, the Native American who was here, had they do one eighth gets this, one fourth gets this. Then if you do that, what happens is we can trace that biologically and there's nothing to argue. So when you come across a case and instead of saying black, you say ADOS, well, here's my proof because I have DNA evidence and I'm traced this much. That is a solution. One last question. Yeah. Introduce oh. yourself and tell us who you are. Hello, my name is Dr. Titiana Ringstaff. Thank you so much. And for what do you what do you teach? Um, yes. Yeah, so um, I've taught African American history, but I'm. I mean, where are you right now? That's what I'm uh, right now, <laughs> I am at Simmons College oh, of Kentucky. Right. Very I'm proud of that. Right. Very proud of that. Helping to develop our teacher education program. Um, but I wanted to say thank you so much, and I wanted to find out. I have a lot of questions, and I will be reaching out uh, via email. But I also wanted to find out: Do we have a um, a chapter here in Louisville, and what are the steps of becoming having an ADOS chapter here. We, yeah. go, ahead, go ahead. We do have a chapter here. We do? Okay. It's um, somewhat inactive, part due in part to COVID. Okay. But we are getting back. Yeah. Bring it back. Mm -hmm. Corey Arthur giving leadership to it. Okay. So yes, and you. Yeah. <laughs> And, and everything gets more active. Yeah. Um, everything gets more active once the once the national chapters roll out because you have you have a national agenda and you'll have a state local agenda as well. And since that leadership hasn't hasn't been there as well, everything is kind of on pause a little bit. Um, but that that ends soon. Is there any work that you all are doing with a lot of the educational institutions that we have, such as some of our kindergarten through twelfth uh, grade schools? Are you all doing? Well, we have we have the idea of having like we were first we were first start with like a, a college chapter or something like that. But we do have the idea. We have been thinking about ways to which to catch people young before they maybe go to an institution and start thinking a different way because that's what happened to me and how well I guess we all <laughs> it's the leadership for the America and the global community so I guess we all whatever so I, I do think we 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 could think of something I would think of that more as like an ADOS young person's book club right where you start kind of instilling that in people and you just have them read um, about history and just understanding who they are before we and then you add the politics on to that um, that would be a little bit further down the line but yeah I think we should do that before kids uh, for, for lack of a better word get away curriculum <laughs> and ADOS curriculum there you go developed. there you go <laughs> that can be used in these schools. absolutely Thank well, you Sim all. Simmons College is unapologetically ADOS and um, we're going to help need your help in writing that curriculum okay all right okay all right, let me ask you a question finally. We want to support you because by supporting you, we support ourselves. How can we support you? Uh, tell us about how we can keep up with you. Well, you can always go to adopfoundation.org. Um, you, can, you, can, you can give there. You can donate there. You can, you can send a check there. You can PayPal, cash out, whatever you want to do it. So, you know, that's always a way to catch up. We have a newsroom there as well. Um, where we allow people to, you know, where we put up what we've been doing. So the OMB, if you want to check out our presentation to the OMB, you can go there, go to the newsroom, and you can see our presentation. Um, 
me, I, I am on, I have a Patreon Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then I have YouTube on Wednesday. So that's where you can you can catch up and, and, and check us. So we're follow us um, and subscribe, you know, follow us. We, we, we have, you know, the Instagram, we have the Twitter. So we always update everything that's going on with us there too. So. Yeah. And you can uh, find me at tone talks, uh, tone talks.org to su subscribe or donate uh, the tone talks, YouTube channel. when I say tone talks and her channel is actually breaking Brown. So and she just did a wonderful show on affirmative action. That I made my great aunt watch and she went through all of the case law that happened because she read the whole Grutter decision. She read the whole recent decision, and it really would help if you watch that show. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you so very much. Let's give it up again. I would like to announce that Maddie's Kitchen is open. So please patronize Maddie's Kitchen and uh, go down and support her. Chris, is there anything else that we have going on? Okay, then. Well, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, have a great day.